Hello everyone, um, today we are looking at another one of Daniel Corey's games and this time he luckily has the white pieces as we've looked at two black games so far. In this game he's playing against Andre Sigalku, not the more famous Sigalku everyone's aware of that plays on the chess, um, but still an excellent player, 2600. This was played in 2014 in France and at that time Daniel Corey was just below 2400. And this game, this game is something special. So, okay, let's jump into it. We have got moves e4, c5 on the board. We see Daniel playing regularly with one e4. I haven't seen the English a lot. So he gets into Sicilian variations quite often. Knight f3, knight e6, d4. Okay, open Sicilian, takes... And e6, false in variation. Um, okay, let's go forward. Bishop e2, also probably um, not, not a mainline bishop e2. Uh, knight e3 is the normal variation, but okay, Cordry's prepped this and we'll see what ideas he has in mind. Uh, bishop e2 and knight f6 in the game, and knight c3, and d6. Okay, so here we have the, I don't even know how to pronounce it, the Scheveningen variation, or the modern variation of this, with pawns on d6 and e6. And the bishop on e2 and knight on c3 um, has caught my attention. So castles, bishop e7, and now he makes a direct move, concrete move, knight takes c6. And we will see what idea he has in mind in a second. So you need to go b takes c6. And now he goes queen d3. Main move castles and queen g3. So the queen slips over to the king's side and immediately stuff like bishop h6 is threatened. So instead of queen g3, um, Something like b3 is definitely also playable. And after castles, um, queen g3 has been played more often. So you're not activating the bishop like this. You're threatening things with the bishop immediately. Um, that's the point of queen g3. It's a different way of developing that bishop. So okay, king goes h8, so there's no more bishop h6. And it's probably a useful square. And then in this in this position, Cordery plays a new move which hasn't been seen um, before, and it's e5. Now I've drawn these arrows because e5 comes with a very specific idea. Um, it's there to attack the and open the d file, but in the variation that ensues, you do manage to double your own pawns here. So, okay, what if just d5? then suddenly the pawn gets taken, so you can, ugh, the, the knight gets taken, so you see that um, something needs to be done about this pawn, it can't just be ignored, and something like knight d5 immediately is okay, um, and this would have also been an option for Andre to play, and something like f4 should keep some tension, maybe this wasn't what he wanted, so e5 really a nice move and it forces okay this following variation um, which Andre comes up with so okay immediately d takes okay queen takes and knight d5 okay threatening <laughs> not really a threat but a positional move asking to um, fix these pawns and then play with definitely an endgame advantage because it's more than a four versus three on this side and they've already progressed some central control really nice moves coming up maybe even clasping the center even further so this is kind of what knight d5 does itself so it's not really a capturable knight um, unless you want to give some play to um, to black so the, the stronger move would be something like rook d1 which quarterly plays keeping tension on this queen and knight. Okay, so Andre plays bishop d6, and then after bishop d6, queen h5, 
finally this knight's not pinned and he decides okay it's a positional move to double these pawns so this is why initially when we were here um it felt to me that e5 comes with a very specific idea of taking the d file but it comes at the expense of doubling these pawns and this is something um Cordry definitely had evaluated so okay queen c7 c7 queen c7 is the move for your queen when you're black um colson just calls it the lazy man's move but it, it's usually just a good move for your queen so be active in the game and safe it's off of that file supporting you um okay rook d4 natural move just heading heading over to h4 which is why the following moves might surprise you after g6 queen h6 um and f6 probably you'd expect rook h4 now uh the last two moves were tempo moves like the in order for the queen to come over and safeguard h7 but now you would expect rook h4 after anything um but that's not what cordry does he goes bishop e3 first and okay let's let's look at rook h4 and g5 which could maybe have been cordry's concern in this case but after moving your rook all the way to a4 this rook is actually pretty nice and there's not a concrete way of getting close to it it always comes back even d4 could have been an option then you provoke this g5 g5 move i'm not sure why he didn't want to provoke this maybe he felt that the squares for his rook were going to become less and with insertion of the the pawn on g5 when e4 and f5 come rolling um, his opponent might just make it to f3 with tempo so this could have been one of the reasons so he doesn't do that he first goes bishop e3 and now after e5 still doesn't go rook h4 even though it's a perfectly sound move um also we should just mention that after after rook h4 bishop f5 um if g5 now in the future you don't have rook a4 really anymore because then this drops the pawn on c2 so doing this immediately might have been a bit more a bit stronger so in this case um after e5 daniel doesn't go rook h4 immediately um he goes back with his rook to d2 it's a fine move and preparing to double these rooks so he uses the idea of tempo in the situation to do something productive um, rook a4 immediately is also fine because there's no there's not a pawn close by or the bishop's taking a while to get at this rook and you you could renew this threat at any moment and now the rook is ready to double up on either the b or the d file not the d file anymore but options are there this pawn's also needed to be safeguarded okay but rook a4 computer like move so it's understandable rook d2 bishop e6 and rook d1 rook d8 and now bishop takes a7 totally out of this fold and clearly um he was looking to grab a pawn but he had he had ideas of entering into the eighth rank in his mind when playing bishop takes a7 so the idea is obviously that if rook takes now you can just take on d6 and after this check then you're picking up that rook again and you're probably definitely winning because of moves like this killing the king so this was an idea that bishop you can't really take immediately and also something like queen takes just also loses that bishop so quite a nice nice thing to spot i'm sure he did calculate the move c5 which traps the bishop and his idea here was to do a bishop f3 so bishop take a7 a cool move but actually a mistake in light of c5 trapping the bishop bishop f3 hitting that rook and also kind of forcing the situation of okay um are we going to do this whole story of where i get to check you and get to the eighth rank um but maybe 
maybe Daniel just overlooked this move, bishop f8, and also the stronger move, which wasn't played in the game, bishop e7. And bishop e7 actually makes that after you take that rook on a8, um, I'm going to capture this bishop and have two minus for the piece, which is fine. So this is the this is what pretty much what bishop e7 does. Um, and also after taking your first, now you get rook takes d8 here, and this bishop is still falling. So bishop e7 really a strong move. The grandmaster Andre doesn't play it though. He actually gives Squadry a shot at the game again. Um, he goes bishop f. Eight, attacking the queen and then see here that okay I think Daniel might have played a, a bit too fancy um, and he went for bishop takes a8 now um, his idea was that the queen can't be taken immediately and after this rook check there's there's more than enough compensation Let's just show that so the bishop takes a6, rook takes d8, check king g7, and for some reason this move um, seems to be fine, threatening to bring the bishop back somehow, and also renewing some threats here. Okay, so he, he doesn't go for for the stronger move though. He got he doesn't go for rook takes d8, which should lead to some equality, um, because now this bishop is pinned. And this rook can't really capture you anymore, so you kind of need to capture while this bishop's being attacked. So, okay, after rook takes d8, rook takes d8, and queen takes d8, playing queen h4 should be pretty drawish. So, uh, what about, sorry, what about um, queen takes d8 first? Now we've just got the simple queen take, rook takes and rook takes and the same queen h4. So, down a queen in that line, so I wouldn't want to do that. So bishop f8, quite uh, an aesthetic move, but um, in practical terms, it actually just threw away the advantage again. And this should really have been the moment where Cordry went rook takes d8. Instead he goes for bishop takes a8, um, which mm, it's a bit too fancy in my eyes, it doesn't really do what it should. Because after rook takes a8, which um, Zigolku played, queen had to go back to h4. And now black can actually just pick up this bishop whenever he wants to. It's still boxed and attacked too many times. So Zigolku here plays g5. Stronger move maybe would have just been to go king g7 and consolidate um, on the king side. After g5, it just feels like his stuff is a bit, bit too airy and the king could be exposed. Okay, so now we've got queen e4, ah, queen h5, and looking to enter on, on the 8th rank still after the bishop's taken, and it's still not necessary to, to capture this bishop. Bishop e7 is good enough. But okay, he captures the bishop now, and now Cordy finally comes into the 8th rank like he planned, and king g7 is played, and h4. Finally, he finds a purpose for this weird move to be played earlier. Moves his queen back, and now moves the queen to where the pawn can be attacked. Okay. Um, g4 is played in the game, though. It's an okay move. And queen e8, finally. Now you are in the king side. But this is rel this is defended relatively easily after queen f7. The queen needs to run again because you don't want to trade queens and play this end game. So two bishops against the rook end game. So rook c8 and now it's a bit of shuffling and then suddenly the game was over after some shuffling. Uh, it's worth saying that black is minus three at the moment. Bishop c5 developing and g3. And king h6, black is still really doing well. And Cordy just shuffles around a bit and plays the move rook b7. And this doesn't really threaten anything. Um, if the rook is taken, 
um, Cordery's point is that maybe he'd be able to do something here. But after something like bishop e8, queen takes e7, even this endgame should still be relatively easy, though the king is a bit far. This was probably what Sigok was afraid of after the nice rook b7. Um, but he also had the option of playing bishop e6 now and keeping queens on the board um, in this endgame, which he then clearly is dominating because of the two bishops versus a rook. He doesn't, though. He, he makes a final blunder. He goes for move f5. And it's here that Cordry's tactical instincts just went spark. And, okay, you can try and spot what he played here. Yeah, obviously, after you paused, you probably sacrificed your queen. When the rook takes c7, and you are right. This is more than enough compensation for white suddenly. And I'm not too sure why the grandmaster played this. Um, I think he, he felt that he should probably be forcing something on the king's side. Um, for some threats, finally, for his bishop to bishops to do, and maybe he thought that okay, well, there aren't too many great squares for the white queen, so. But the move, the move rook takes c7 is just strong, and after Zigalku took the queen, uh, which you seriously want to do. There's not there's not much else to do here. The other rook enters the game, and now suddenly you see the threat on h7, getting mated suddenly. So bishop takes f2, and then he doesn't even take that bishop. The queen moved back, and now there's a mate in 3. After the move, rook c6, check. Um, Zigalku resigned the game. Um, because now it's mate in 2, queen f6, rook takes, and after king h5, finally, rook takes h7 mate. And just show that, or king h5 immediately. Here we've got queen h6, and you can even battery your rooks for a mate. Most painful type of mate. Now, I think to summarize what Cordry did right in this game, um, was initially with his plan, his opening plan to go um, e5. It was, it was quite a nice idea to have some play on this file. Though it did feel like stuff didn't really do what he wanted to with h4. He kept with his opening idea, so he probably knew how strong this file was. He, he remained productive and then he sniped a pawn. And he was actually quite fine. This is this move is kind of too deep to refute, I think, over the board. Um, and then he got lucky with this final blunder by the Grandmaster. It, this wasn't a blitz game or anything. This was a classical game, 90, 40, plus 20. And I'm not too sure what the situation was back in 2014, but something like um, F5 feels like Quite a natural move to play as black, but to pick up that it's a blunder probably happened in some kind of time control issue, and I think this is where Cordry is really good, just keeping that pressure there um, after having a good opening and maybe some type of advantage, advantage earlier. This is his tactical eye, spotting rook takes c7, f takes e, rook takes, and then it's just game over. Okay, thank you, I hope you enjoyed.